There has been an interesting connection between our last couple of months of not meeting together and our study in the book of Romans. Since we've been studying Romans backwards, we did the rubber meets the road section before we did the theology section. And I'm glad we did because of this connection between COVID-19 and Romans 12 through 16. It has become strangely specific. So this morning I want to share some strange lessons I'm learning about myself from Romans during the pandemic. Let me know you're smiling. I don't know how you're supposed to do that. <laughs> uh, anyway, this is, this is a little bit strange. It's a strange sermon at a strange time. I guess it works. I suspect many of you have learned lots of lessons and are continuing to learn lessons. And uh, some of the same lessons I am going to share. All right. Strange lesson number one. People who are not central to my life are strangely important. This is not going to work. <laughs> when we studied Romans 16, I made the point that people are important. And to honor people, I encouraged us to remember their names. We went through the whole thing about remembering people's names. I thought that was a significant lesson. But what I've learned now is that people who are I'm going to say peripheral to my life provide a strange continuity to life. Many of you I only see on Sunday. Uh, others I see occasionally at different, different times and occasions. But there's a flow of life that incorporates each other. And that flow of life is strangely important. The consistency of meeting together, the consistency of seeing people and interacting with people that I only see once a week is important to my faith. I never thought of myself as a person who needs lots of other people to be happy. But the connections we have in Christ provide me with continuity. So as I read Romans 16, it has become more specific than I ever would have thought. Romans 16, 6 through 16. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet David, Todd, and Tara, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. Greet Steve, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Jared, my fellow worker in Christ, and his beloved Sydney. Greet Jolene, who is appro approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of the Farley Browns. Greet my kinsmen, the McCurleys. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of the shepherds. Greet those who work in the Lord, Lynn and Vicki. Greet the beloved Gary, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet one another with a holy air fist bump. All the churches of Christ greet you. These greetings are a part of a larger circle of connections that keep my faith going. To me, that was a strange lesson. And I'm continuing to learn it. Strange lesson number two. Obeying the government is strangely selective. We studied Romans 13, verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And at that time, I said we need to pay our taxes. And everybody, although everybody hates paying taxes, everybody agreed we need to pay taxes. But throughout this current crisis, with the governor giving us orders and telling us to do this and not do that, I find myself strangely all over the place. For example, when they put up parking cones on the golf course parking lot, I almost went crazy. I could not figure that out at all. Are they making sure the cars don't get COVID? 
It made no sense. So I was tempted to drive over all the cones with my car. And now we have to wear a mask. Seriously? I can't do it. I can't preach with a mask on. I'm sorry. Sorry, Governor, come arrest me. I don't know what to do. So as we reevaluate Romans 13.1, I have to ask myself the question, is selective obedience obedience at all? Yeeks. That has been a strange lesson for me. Lesson three. Motivation is strangely hard without interaction. When I virtually read Romans 12.1, I made the point that we're standing on the mercies of God overlook. We look out and we see all the mercies of God. All the love, all the beauty that God has given us. And it is God who motivates us. But I've struggled with being excited about doing good because of the lack of interaction. I love my Bible class on Sunday morning. I love the give and take, the different perspectives, the eureka moments. We can catch an insights from Scripture. And you can't do that on a video. It has been a challenge to me to get excited about doing my job because I don't see your faces. I still don't see your faces. It's excited to get it's hard to get excited when there is no interaction. But I've worked on it. I've worked on it. And just last week I got excited about making videos. I found my groove within the virtual church and now I'm back to preaching. <laughs> that is why Paul tells us in Romans 12 verses 9 through 11, let hope be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. My zeal is recharged by love and affection and showing honor. My motivation has been strangely, strangely affected by the lack of seeing your faces. And that has kind of been a strange lesson for me. Lesson number four. Old dogs can learn new tricks. I'm working on this one. If you watched the first video I did, it was kind of like a terrorist kidnapping video. But last week, I told the beautiful story of a little boy and an old woman. I'm proud of being able to learn a new skill. Preaching is different than speaking to a camera. Cameras don't smile. Cameras don't go to sleep either, though. <laughs> so Paul tells us in verse 2 of Romans 12 about learning new things. Romans 12:2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Some of that has to be, be willing to be transformed by the continual renewing of your mind so that you can learn what is the will of God, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We can learn the will of God when we open up to learn and have our minds renewed. I'm strangely proud of myself being the old dog who learned a new trick. Now I'm working on Zoom. I hadn't quite got there, and we were struggling a little bit with Facebook. Lesson number five. Not judging others is strangely difficult. There are two kinds of people in the world. There's idiots and maniacs. Idiots are those people who are more rule-following, slower, and more careful than me. Maniacs are those who are freer, looser with the rules, faster, and less cautious than me. Everyone in the world is either an idiot or a maniac. They're either tighter than me or looser than me. Therefore, they're idiots and maniacs. 
Those who follow the quarantine rules more stringently than me are idiots. Those who have been disregarded the rules are maniacs. It's strangely hard for me not to do this, not to think of the world as idiots and maniacs. But we learned Romans 14.10 not that long ago. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? You remember live and let die. We remember not to judge each other. We know all this. We learned all this. I preached all this. And yet it's been strangely difficult not to think of everyone else in the world as either idiots or maniacs. That's been a hard lesson. Another hard lesson is number six. Others' others' motivations are strangely difficult to judge. This is one I'm still working on a lot. When I see someone doing something that I disagree with, I'm quick to judge their motives. They just want the attention. They enjoy the power. They just crave being the center of the drama. They just don't care very much. They just don't care about anybody but themselves. They are certainly millennial or boomer. When others behave in a way that I don't approve of, I often attribute false motives. Boy, this is harsh. Can you know someone else's heart? Can you know what their motives are? I, can't, I don't even know my own motives. I do things I don't know why I do. I say things I don't even mean. My own motives are a mixture of altruism and selfishness. I have a hard time sorting out my own emotions. How then can I judge someone else's motives? Listen to the flavor of Romans 12, 14 through 17. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. That's exactly what I'm saying. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Wow. I need to be extremely careful judging the motivations of others. That's a hard lesson. Less, less than the last. Peer pressure is a strange thing. You would think that I, being the old dog, would be immune to peer pressure. I'm not a teenager worried about what some young, sweet young thing thinks about me. I've known what my sweet young thing thinks about me since the early 70s. <laughs> But when I go anywhere, the first thing I look for is, is everybody else wearing their masks? Maybe I need to put my mask on. Everybody else has, no, no one has their mask. Oh, what am I going to do? The peer pressure is weird. I, I, I meet somebody and I want to shake their hands. What do I do? I wait to see if they want to shake my hand first. I'm not, I don't, I want to touch that. Is anybody watching? If no one's watching, I'll touch it. Is everyone else keeping their social distance? Are you keeping your social distance? Isn't that a dumb word? I don't know who invented it, but surely two months ago, someone came up with the word social distance. Why not anti-social distance? <laughs> Why not non-infectious distance? Why not even safe distance? Social distance? Peer pressure is a strange thing that even works on old dogs. And that's been a, a hard lesson for me. But maybe it's a good thing. Maybe peer pressure is actually a good thing. Listen to Romans 14 and 15. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. That sounds like peer pressure. Romans 15, 2 and 3. Let, us, let each of us please his neighbor... For his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, let the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Perhaps allowing what others approve or don't approve of 
helps us to keep the peace. We need to honor each other. In honoring each other, we follow the example of Christ. And that is certainly a lesson that we need to learn. So those are some of the lessons that I am working on. Some of the lessons that I will continue to work on. I'm sure I will learn other lessons over the next few months. And perhaps that is the point of this sermon. You need to have a point, Tim. What's the point? Well, the point of the sermon is we need to be open to the lessons of the Spirit. We need to be ready to learn our lessons. We need to be moldable. Hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll work our way backwards to Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know that for the, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, and here's where the good part comes in, to be conformed to the image of his Son. To be molded to the image of his Son. To be like Jesus Christ. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Through the challenges of what happens to us or around us, we should allow ourselves to be conformed to his image. God works through stuff to make us like his son. We allow the spirit to mold us into his image. We learn our lessons.